guy named Joe who gets a free ticket to the Super Bowl from his company. Don't spoil it. Not everybody's heard it. Unfortunately, when Joe gets to the stadium, he realizes that the seat is the last row in the corner of the stadium, and he finds himself closer to the Goodyear blimp than he is to the field. But about halfway through the first quarter, he sees through his binoculars an empty seat, 10 rows back, right on the 50-yard line. So he decides to take a chance, and he makes his way through the stadium, and around the security guards, and gets to the empty seat, and as he plops himself down, he says to the guy sitting next to him, excuse me, is anyone sitting here? The man says, no. Now he's very excited with this kind of terrific seat for the game. So Joe asks the man beside him again, listen, this is incredible. Who in their right mind would have a seat like this for the Super Bowl and not use it? The man replies, well, actually, the seat belongs to me. I was supposed to come with my wife, but she passed away. It's the first Super Bowl we haven't been together since we got married in 1965. Oh, the guy said, that's really sad. But still, couldn't you find anyone to take the seat, a friend, a close relative? Nope, said the man, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> So I commend you highly. You know, a lot of sermons are theologically sound. They're even interesting, deep, provocative, but not very practical. What I'm hoping this morning is that this one will be all of the above, but with special emphasis on helping you get through hard times as we focus on parts of Isaiah 43 and think about the topic of turning opposition into opportunity. People in the 21st century are hairy. We live at a hectic pace. We've got lots going on, lots to keep track of, things to juggle, stresses and pressures, demands and expectations and needs, those we place on ourselves and sometimes those that come from others. And over the course of a day or a week, we encounter resistance. We find ourselves in struggles. We hit obstacles and opposition. And truth be told, most of us would be happy to dodge the onslaught if we could, or just neutralize it. But Isaiah 43 unfolds for us that as the people of God, we're not just to neutralize it, but actually to benefit from it. So let's dig in. But now says the Lord your creator, the one who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God speaking and says, I am your creator. I am the one who formed you. Psalm 103 tells us that God is so aware of our limitations in our context that God has not dealt with us according to our iniquities or rewarded us according to our shortfall. And just as a parent has compassion on his or her children, the scripture says, so God has compassion on those who fear God. Now, unfortunately, fear is not what we think it is in that context. It means those who honor or revere God. For God knows our frame and is mindful that we're made out of dust. In fact, Psalm 139 that we heard part of last week in, in, in the message and the reading from 
uh, that Tony shared with us in his message, that God knows when we rise up and when we sit down, that God understands our thoughts from afar, that even before there's a word on our lips, God knows what we're about to say, that God does watch our paths and is intimately, intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And then the psalmist goes on to say, God, you were there when I was carefully being knit together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, the psalmist says, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When's the last time you looked in the mirror at yourself and said, wow, I am fearfully and wonderfully made in the very image and likeness of God, our heavenly parent, who formed us and breathed into us God's very own ruach. The Hebrew word means breath or spirit. And that God of the universe desired companionship with humanity generally and with each one of you specifically. So much that God redeemed us. When you redeem something, you buy it back. And I want you to know God thought you were well worth it. I have redeemed you. You are mine. God claims us. Stamps or brands or tattoos us with a big M-I-N-E. You are mine. You're not detached out there floating around. You belong. And God knows your name. Intimately known. You're not just a hey fella or sir or ma'am or hey you to God. God knows your name. And by the way, there's a possessive adjective in front of that. I remember when I was about to become a parent and I didn't want the child who ended up being a daughter, to just call me the other mother, the parent. And she came up and she called me my Baba. She still does. This is my Baba. This one belongs to me. And you are God's child. God says, my son, my daughter, you belong to me. And calls out your name. And there's something very soothing about hearing your name. Jesus talks about it. In John 10, in the context of a shepherd calling out the sheep, you know, it was the custom of shepherds in that day to fold lots of sheep together. And each shepherd would stand and make certain sounds, a certain call. And you'd see little lambs and sheep's head popping up. The ones that recognized that voice would respond and the rest didn't. And then another shepherd would call out and they would follow because they knew the voice. They understood that that was their shepherd. So God begins to reassure people in this passage in Isaiah by taking them down memory lane. Sort of like um, some of us have already started doing and we're gonna invite you to come along with us as we um, celebrate our 20th anniversary. But Isaiah takes them all the way back and says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I circled the word when in my Bible. And by the way, if you have a Bible you can't buy it, get rid of it and get one you can. Don't, don't get rid of it. Keep it. But get one. You know, I don't know what you guys do, you techies do now with your iPads and stuff. I guess you could just highlight it. When you pass through the waters, not if. So what that means is people who are called by God's name, people who are connected and intimately known and loved by God, people in whose image are created, in God's image are created and called good, are going to have deep waters in their lives. So when you go through the storms, don't think, oh my goodness, I must have missed it somewhere. You think, oh my goodness, here I am in the midst of deep waters, and God is with me. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overtake you. I think that God was reminding them through Isaiah of that trap that their ancestors had made out of Egypt. 
when they came upon the Red Sea. And there's Pharaoh's army and all the power and noise behind them. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? And Moses held out his staff and the water separated and they went through. And that's what I think God wanted them to know. Maybe they were thinking about Joshua when Israel was crossing the Jordan. And there they were, and he said, as soon as the souls of the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant touch the water, the rivers stood up. Or maybe some of them were thinking about that wonderful image that David used when he talked about, you lead me beside the still waters. You know, sheep are terrified of rushing water. Because, can you imagine having a dozen fur coats on and falling in deep water? <laughs> you wouldn't fare very well. So they're terrified. And I think not one detail escapes God on your behalf. And so the shepherd says, I will lead you beside still waters, quiet waters. We have floods in our life. Sometimes literal, more often figurative. Do you ever feel inundated with stuff to handle? Sometimes it may be financial bills that come in and unexpected, resources lacking. Sometimes it's a flood, an onslaught of health crises and tests and trials and doctors and medications and MRIs and CAT scans and x-rays and all this kind of stuff. Sometimes our cars break down and always at the worst possible time. For some, it might be moving or getting ready to move. For others, unsettling and unpacking. Maybe it's a work or a job challenge. And sometimes, you know, coworkers can really make our life difficult. Maybe it's a family relationship or a struggle with a partner or family member. And God says, don't fear. I'm with you. When you're feeling inundated with all this stuff, God says, I'm there. There's a song that I love. It says, when I think, you were afraid I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> you really were. I bet I'd really have to apologize worse than the opening <laughs> joke. When I think I'm going under, part the water, Lord. When I feel the waves around me, calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in me. And then Isaiah goes on and Second part of verse 2, it says, and again, not if, when you walk through the fire, you will not even be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. There are times in our lives when we feel heat. We feel the heat of a situation. We feel under the gun. We feel the pressure. And I think maybe they were thinking back on the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. And how, because they did the right thing when the wrong thing would have saved their necks, they ended up being cast into a literal oven of fire. They didn't avoid the fire. But when the count was made that day, how many did we throw in? Three? It looks like there's a fourth one in there. Guess what? God shows up even in the midst of you taking the heat. Unfortunately, most of us define protection. And when we say, God, protect me, what we mean is, keep me out of affliction. And what God says is sometimes the consequences, sometimes you're going to end up there despite your best efforts. And God says, guess what? right there in the middle with you. And verse 3, God says to Isaiah, For I am the Lord your God, 
I just like that reminder. Not just the God or a God, but I am your God, your Savior. And since, verse 4 says, you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other people an exchange and ransom for you. Wow. God says, since I love you so much, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be in a personal relationship with you. The cost of an only son, huge ransom. But God believes and knows you're all worth it. And then verse 5 and 6, God's talking about do not fear. I'm never far away. I'm right there. You've got to wonder, where did we get that idea about God being somewhere far off in the heavens, out of our reach, when God is right here with us? Everyone, verse 7 says, called by my name. Everyone who will take on my name. Everyone whom I created. And by the way, God doesn't randomly, haphazardly create. God says, but for my glory, those whom I have formed and made. The Hebrew words talk about being carefully crafted, being uniquely created, not mass produced. And then, verse 18, Isaiah says, do not call to mind the former things or ponder things in the past. It doesn't mean that we can't look back, but there's a sense in this of a longing and yearning, a sense that, oh, the good old days, you know, it's never going to be quite that good again. And that's not what Isaiah wants us. You know, rearview mirrors are useful. You glance at them once in a while, you see what's back there. But you know, windshields are a lot bigger than rearview mirrors. That's for a reason. Because when you go forward, you want to look ahead. God says, I will do a new thing. I will make a roadway in the wilderness. I will make rivers in the desert. I wonder what would happen if each one of us in our own lives, and in our own sphere of influence, would really pull up the stops and trust God that fully. What if we really took God at God's word in Isaiah 43? Can you imagine a congregation being more unstoppable? And then the words that Jesus spoke in our gospel lesson from Mark 10, that, yeah, perhaps with some people, stuff would be impossible. But with God, in God, through God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you to thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you to rise. And we've got a contemporary song. Um, but if you need to... Here it is, what friend we have in Jesus. Let's rise and sing it together.